So today we have Erica Berg. Erica is actually one of the associate professors in the equine science uh, department at NDSU, and she is also the program director for Bison Strides Equine Assisted Activities and Therapies. So that's one of her big pet projects that she has going, or a big project she has going at NDSU, um, but she also does quite a bit or has done quite a bit with uh, equine conditioning and and knowing knowing all the physiology of that horse. Um, so she has joined us today to talk about conditioning the equine athlete. And I'd like to turn it over to someone who was my mentor at college also as well, Erica Berg. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Um, so I'm seeing a couple of things in the chat, looking at uh, some things for getting horses fit so they're not overstressed. Young horse exercises here. Okay, so. All right, we'll go ahead and get started and then I'll let, um, I will let Paige and Rachel, you guys feel free to jump in if there's other things that pop up as we're going through our presentation today, okay? Um, first, thanks everybody for joining, joining us on this last Wednesday of May, which is a little bit crazy that the month of May is already kind of flown by, but here we are, so. Um, this is just our non-discrimination statement that has to be posted for all of the extension um, presentations and publications that are done. All right, so without any further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and jump right in. So if we think about the horse's primary job in the United States today, okay, the horse's job is to be an athlete. And so what that degree of athleticism looks like is gonna be very different depending on the discipline that you ride, what level you ride at. And with my students, I like to compare um, this with my sister and I. My sister is a world champion Ironman triathlete. So a few years ago, she swam a mile in the ocean in Hawaii and then ran a marathon and rode a bike for hundred miles. And I'm like more of a couch to 5K person. So there's some athleticism that's required do a couch to 5k right but nothing like it would be to do like a world Ironman championship and so on this slide we've got some some different images right we have a jumper in the upper right hand corner we've got um somebody doing ranch work out like on a working ranch you've got a western pleasure in the center bale racing quarter horse racing and then we have a therapy horse uh down in the middle and then trail riding and so all of those animals need to be fit and sound, but the degree at which they need to be fit and sound are different, right? And so um, it's just important to remember that any time we're working a horse or doing something with them, they are being an athlete. And so what degree that is, is kind of what uh, differentiates some of the different things. And so our primary goal of conditioning then, if we're just going to look at some really basic things, are to improve both psychological or mental responses to exercise as well as the physical and physiological responses to exercise. And before we even do that, there are some basic conditioning considerations. And these are actually gonna be both for the horse and the human, right? Um, because for instance, if you are just starting out in Western pleasure, like you've never done that before, that's gonna look different than somebody who's been doing it for 20 years, right? And so your knowledge of the discipline is going to impact the ability of you to condition and train your horse for that particular event. Um, and so that is important. Also, what level of competition are you looking at competing at, right? Is it um, a couple of weekends in the summer for a horse show or are you planning to be on the road for the entire summer or fall traveling to horse shows? Because that transport is also gonna be an issue uh, potentially for, for horses. Uh, what is the animal's current fitness level, right? What is your current fitness level? As we all know, if you've anybody, I'm assuming everybody in here has probably ridden a horse, it takes muscles and it takes fitness to be able to do that well and to do that effectively. And so considering your current fitness level as well as the horses is super important to figure out where you're gonna be starting from. Any past injuries, horse and human, okay, um, is gonna dictate a little bit what, where you're starting from, all right? Uh, and then again, prior experience in the discipline, we talked about that a little bit. And then how much time do you have 
right? If you have a full-time job and three little kiddos at home, it's, it's going to be hard, right? You're going to have to just carve out some time to do this. Um, and so time is, is an issue. That's a realistic, real world type of thing. And then age. So um, not only the horse's age, but the human's age. So I um, am 49 today, actually. And there are horses. When I was 20, I would get on anything that somebody put in front of me. And today I will not do that because I have a little bit more self-preservation as I'm aging and I've got three kids and a family, right? And so I'm not gonna get on the crazy racehorses like I did in grad school and ride around when they're not really that broke. I'm not doing that anymore. And so, and those are things to consider and things to think about because I think as we get older, kind of, I don't know if our mortality sort of sinks in a little bit, but just thinking about what is worth the risk um, is a real consideration. So consider that. And if you have a horse that makes you nervous or makes you scared, then maybe that is a bad match. Okay. And so, and that's okay to say tapping out and I need to look for something different. Uh, and then before you begin, of course, the horse has to be sound, right? They have to be sound in wind and limb, that old age old adage. So their breathing has to be sound, right? If they have any type of um, any type of recurrent obstructive airway disease, that's gonna significantly impact, right? Their ability to exercise because oxygen is required for exercise. Uh, and then their legs, they have to be sound. Their feet, right? If they're not sound, an exercise program is, um, or a conditioning program for competition, right? Conditioning for rehab, that's gonna look a lot different than conditioning for a competition. Um, is the animal healthy overall? Are they up to date in their shots? Are they up to date? on their deworming? Are they up to date on all that stuff that we need to make sure that they're, they're healthy and ready to go? Um, they shod and trimmed properly for what their needs are. And if you're unsure of any of this, you should always, of course, talk to your veterinarian or farrier okay, to make sure that your horse is ready to go because we want to set them up for success and reduce the chance of injury or illness for sure. So the two conditioning components are the psychological adaptations and then the physiological adaptations. And so the psychological adaptations, um, I do like to mention to folks, it's important to understand training principles. You don't have to be a psychologist or an animal behaviorist, but it is important, I think, to understand the reasons behind what you're doing when we're asking a horse to do something. So when, they, when we apply pressure and they give to the pressure, doing what we want, okay, that's an example of negative reinforcement in psychological Speak, right? So negative doesn't mean bad in that instance, it means taking away. So you're taking away the pressure to reinforce the behavior of them doing what you wanted them to do. Okay. And so there's a group called the International Society for Equitation Science that's got some really good information on just training principles, um, psychological principles, not just for horses, but like for dogs and I suppose cats, people, right? Anything. So it's a good, a good website to visit. Uh, and so it's important then that you understand those, those training principles as well as understanding horse behavior. So hopefully everybody that sees this gray, this dapple gray on the right-hand side with the red halter with his eyes bugged out and his head up, that horse is clearly like in a little bit of distress, right? Maybe doesn't wanna do what you asked it to do, but he is not calm and willing compared to the horse that's under saddle in the middle, right? We want the horse in the middle. We don't want to have the horse on the right. Um, and it's also important to think about the human impact on behavior. There was a study that was done a few years ago that I love to talk about. And in this particular study, they had horses that they spooled around a ring in front of somebody that was standing at one end with a, with a umbrella. They didn't open the umbrella, but they schooled the horses around. They had heart rate monitors on them. And until the horse's heart rate didn't change, they kept schooling them. Once the, her the horse was fine with a human, they brought people in and said, okay, we'd like you to ride this horse around the ring. When you get to that lady with the umbrella, she's gonna open it, okay? And they had heart rate monitors on the humans and they had heart rate monitors on the horses. Now the horses had been fine, right? With that umbrella lady standing there. But as soon as we added the rider and we said, they are going to open that umbrella. It, when the horses started to come around that turn, the rider's heart rate went up the horse's heart rate went up in anticipation because the rider was communicating to the horse, 
something bad is going to happen. That lady with the umbrella is going to open it and you're going to spook and it's going to be a train wreck, right? In their head. And so, and they did the same thing with people just horse handling, leading on the ground. And that same response was seen. So even just through the lead rope. So it's really important that we are mindful of our issues that we might have or fears or distresses when we're working with the horses because that definitely translates to them, okay? And so making sure that you're being mindful and that you recognize and um, sort of figure out any issues that you might have or things that are distressful to you. Uh, some other things that are good for psychologically for the horses are to vary their routine, okay? So I kind of like to ride in an arena. I don't really like to trail ride. I like to ride in the arena, which my dad totally doesn't understand, but that's not necessarily great for my horse, right? Like it's good to go outside, first of all, to get them used to different things. And so they don't get bored. And so um, on the lower left here, there's a guy that's long lining the horse, okay? That is an awesome thing with a little caveat of making sure you know what you're doing with this and you have somebody that can assist you um, because horses can get pretty freaked out if those lines get tangled around their legs and they can kick and they can hurt you. So just make sure that you take time if you don't know how to do that, that you learn how to do that. And I've got some resources at the end. Um, hill work, if you have hills here in Eastern North Dakota, we don't necessarily have a lot of those, but just going outside and riding in a field if you have access to that. And then the bottom um, is just showing rates right, some different things that we can kind of do. There's some really cool extreme trail courses that are out there and um, those are just interesting because they keep the horse's mind engaged a little bit. And so ultimately our goal is for a confident and willing partner, right? We want this horse on the lower right hand corner. We don't necessarily want to be on the gray horse or the sorrel horse, right? So those horses are telling us something. So maybe they're saying I'm painful. Maybe they're saying my saddle doesn't fit. Maybe they're saying my teeth need to be floated, the bit is hurting my mouth. And so it's important if the horse is responding in a negative, in a bad way, in an in a angry way to your A's or to your Q's that you figure out what that is. And maybe it's just that they don't feel like working it that day and they need to work through that. But it's important to make sure there's no physical pain that's going on because most of the time there is, I would say more times than not, there's a physical issue for what we would consider bad horse behavior, okay? So tap kit's really important, making sure their teeth are in good shape is really important as well. Okay, so then moving on to physiological adaptations, we're just gonna kind of touch on the respiratory, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and then thermoregulation. So the respiratory system, obviously important because that's how the horse is getting oxygen into their body. Uh, at a resting a horse, an average adult horse just standing breathing is taking in a little over a gallon of air per breath. If we average 12 breaths per minute, that's 16 gallons per minute that they're breathing in. And then if we look at exercise, okay, hard exercise, that's going to increase, okay, by four. And then they're taking in 150 breaths per minute at least. And that's going to equal over 600 gallons of air that they're breathing in and out of their body per minute. And this picture down here is a photo of horse lungs that have been inflated. They're huge and it's totally cool. So if you ever have an opportunity to be present when um, during a necropsy, if that's something that you feel like, okay, um, being present at or um, watching, this is totally cool. To see how huge the horse lungs are um, is really kind of mind blowing. And the respiratory rate, so here's the thing with respiratory rate. If you type in horse respiratory rate, you'll, there'll be a bunch of different, different answers, right? But essentially we can safely, pretty safely say eight to 20 breaths per minute for a horse, adult horse at rest, okay? And this is where it's important that you know your horse, that you are going to take your horse's respiration rate at rest. And so you know what's normal for your particular horse, okay? And then during heavy exercise that can increase significantly as well. Um, and then this is just a real quick little science. I had to throw a little science in here graph looking at the maximum. So VO2 max is basically the maximum amount of oxygen that a horse can take in. And they got fancy equipment that measures all this with exercise physiology. Um, and what you see, the pink line is the VO2 max in an untrained horse. The blue line is the VO2 max in a trained horse after two months okay, of conditioning. And what we notice is that the horse that's untrained 
essentially runs out of air. So the plateau on both of those graphs is the horse is maxed out and no longer to keep up speed. So these would have been done on a treadmill. And so the horse is maxed out, okay? It's hit fatigue. And so the fastest, right, the horse could go was 11 meters per second. And the VO2 max was 120, okay? We don't need to necessarily need to worry about the units there. But after two months of conditioning, the horse is able to go a meter per second faster, as well as increase the amount of oxygen that they're taking into their body, which is giving more oxygen to the body to be available for use for exercise, okay? So that's a, just an example of that. The cardiovascular system, we're gonna break down into just four parts, the heart rate, heart size, vascular, vascularity, and then red blood cell volume. Whoops. <clears throat> Um, so for the heart rate, here's another, another thing where you'll find a wide range of heart rate ranges if you look online, but um, I typically teach 28 to 44 beats per minute in, in my classes. And again, this is where you need to go and take your horse's heart rate and know what's normal for your horse's resting heart rate, okay? If your horse's resting heart rate is typically 28, and then you go to take it and it's 46, 44, even though that's in the range, that's a little abnormal for your horse. So understanding what your horse's actual heart rate is. And then the maximum heart rate for horses, uh, 220 to 260 beats per minute. So something that's a little bit interesting, if we look at human response, cardiac response to training versus horses response to training, if we have any human athletes out there, um, we oftentimes will look at resting heart rate as an indicator of improving fitness, right, in humans. For horses, that doesn't really change. So their resting heart rate is gonna be their resting heart rate, whether they are unfit and obese or if they're super fit, okay? So the resting heart rate for a horse and the max heart rate for a horse are not good indicators of fitness. What is a good indicator of fitness in horses is the recovery heart rate. So how quickly do they go from exercising, whatever their exercise heart rate is or max heart rate down to back to their resting heart rate, okay? And then their heart rate during exercise, all right? And so we're gonna talk about those those types of things. But in order to use this as a measure of fitness, you have to write it down. You have to track that, okay? So tracking the recovery heart rate of your horse, tracking your heart rate, horse's heart rate during exercise is useful and simple. It's a pretty simple indicator of being able to determine fitness levels of your horses, okay? Um, this is another graph. So this is looking at heart rate on the y-axis and then running speed on the x-axis. And so the blue line is the untrained horse, the red line is the trained horse. And so what we can see here is at 160 beats per minute, the blue line, the untrained horse was only able to get to um, about 390 meters per second versus the horse after two months of training at that same heart rate of 160 beats per minute was able to run at a speed of 450 meters per minute, okay? And so that improvement in um, heart rate, that's the example of the during exercise piece that is demonstrating an increase in fitness after two months of training. The heart of the horse uh, is about nine pounds, okay? Uh, and the size and weight of the horse, horse's heart do increase in response to exercise. And so typically we would see an increase in the size of the chambers of the heart and then hypertrophy or increase in size of the left ventricle, which is the ventricle of the heart that pumps blood to the entire body. Okay. So that's always going to be the thickest, thickest chamber. Okay. Or the thickest ventricle of the heart is that right ventricle. Cause again, it's pumping to the body, the right, or excuse me, the the right ventricle um, is just pumping to the lungs, so it doesn't have as far to go. So that left ventricular hypertrophy, we call that, um, is what you're going to see an increase in. Uh, we also see the vascularity changing. And so what will happen after consistent conditioning um, in some months, some weeks after the horse has been fit, you will see an increase in capillarization. So basically an increase in capillary size and number to the muscle fibers. And the reason that's happening is because now it's able to deliver more oxygen, take away carbon dioxide and waste from the muscle and um, help improve the horse's fitness in that way. And then finally, the last thing with horses is the red blood cell volume. So red blood cells carry oxygen, 
the hemoglobin on the red blood cells carry oxygen, right, throughout the horse's body for, um, pardon me, for um, use during exercise metabolism. The horse's spleen, so that's what is pictured here um, in the, the top picture, and then it's in situ or what it looks like in the horse's body down below. And so the head, it would be facing the left and then the tail, okay, to the right. And so the spleen of the horse stores up to one third of the red blood cells that's produced in the horse's body. And so during an exercise event, when we have, or a stress, okay, that happens, the horse's autonomic or their automatic nervous system kicks in. And we have contract of smooth muscles and the spleen contracts and then it releases additional red blood cells into the horse's bloodstream. So it's kind of got its own built-in like blood doping mechanism. Um, horses who are elite athletes um, or competing at quite a high level who have to have their spleen removed, have a splenectomy for some reason for of injury or disease are never going to be able to be that elite athlete. Like if you have a racehorse, that has to have its spleen out, its career is going to be over because you they no longer have that reserve of red blood cells and oxygen to get to their body. They just run out of air. They would just run out of air too quickly. Uh, okay, so on to the muscles. So the musculoskeletal system. So uh, essentially we're talking about muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and bone. Uh, and so muscles, the muscle size and strength, and then the, also the muscle fiber type can be impacted by conditioning. Uh, tendons and ligaments. So tendons are going to connect muscle to bone and ligaments are con connecting bone to bone. And then obviously the bone is just an important part of this whole thing. I like this picture on the left hand side with the saddle and this skeleton, the super old saddle, because this is a good demonstration of where the saddle sits, right? It's good to visualize this because the saddle is sitting in the middle of the horse's back, should be sitting in the middle of the horse's back. And the weakest part of the horse's back, right, is the lumbar vertebrae here, okay, where there's nothing underneath. There's no ribs supporting it. There's no hind legs supporting that part. And that's oftentimes where like riding double or, you know, doing fun things with our horse, maybe your kids doing that kind of stuff. And so just be mindful because that's the weakest part of the horse's back. Okay. The lumbar vertebrae has really nothing to support underneath of it. And so really considering, considering that when we are um, doing things with our horses. And so musculoskeletal responses to conditioning are going to take a little bit longer than the cardiovascular and respiratory responses to training. And so what we see obviously are going to be increased strength and suppleness. I have a little asterisk next to suppleness because you're not going to see increase in suppleness of the horse if you're not doing any exercises to increase their suppleness and flexibility. They may be very fit cardiovascularly and their muscle strength, but flexibility and suppleness wise, if you're not doing anything to address that, then that's not likely to improve drastically. Okay. And then uh, the tendons and ligaments in bone, those structures are going to remodel or, or um, kind of grow and become stronger in response to the forces that are placed on it. And so that's known as Wolf's Law. And this is just a, like a, a picture kind of of this. So we want to, in order for the horse's bones to become stronger and their ligaments and tendons to kind of become stronger, they need to have work, right? There needs to be increased stress and strain on them, but there can't be too much stress and strain on them, right? So we want us to have this, we have this curve, we don't have to worry about the numbers on this, but trying to keep it within that curve before this breaking point, right? We don't want to get to the point because we obviously can't just keep increasing stress and strain and the animal gets stronger and stronger and stronger. There's a breaking point for that. And that's when we see bow tendons or we see suspensory ligament injuries or we see fractures or we see things happen that are going to take a really long time to heal. And so being mindful of that is also super important. And with, with those types of things, um, being mindful of the type of terrain that you are training your horse in and then showing your horse in, right? So if you are training your horse in like a nice um, supported sand slash dirt arena, but then you go and compete on a much harder surface, 
okay, or vice versa. There just is potential for impact on um, the horse's horses limbs with that, right? So if you're training in a harder surface and then you go compete in super deep sand, then you might risk an increase, have an increased risk for like a bow tendon or something because your horse isn't accustomed or conditioned to that type of terrain. So it's just important to be mindful of what your horse is exercising on in the surface that you're using. Um, the last thing, just super briefly, thermoregulation is important, particularly in the summertime, right? Um, there's four types. Radiation is just the solar energy, essentially convection from the wind, conduction, surface to surface, and then evaporation. So horses and humans are two of the most efficient sweaters and evaporative coolers on the planet. And so uh, this is good as long as the vapor pressure gradient or the humidity in the air is low. If we have 95% uh, humidity, that evaporative cooling for the horse is not gonna be super effective. And so that's when we need to add things like hosing them off, okay? That's conductive cooling. So when you give your horse a bath after it's super hot and then you sweat scrape it off, that water now is a lot warmer, right? That's because heat from the horse's body has transferred to the water. Also, you can add a fan, so that helps with convective cooling and getting them out of the sun, okay? So pretty basic information, but I just kind of like to talk about that, particularly the humidity. Even though horses are super awesome sweaters and that evaporative cooling is great. It only works if there's a vapor pressure gradient that's high, okay, or works well. Okay, so when we're thinking about vital signs for exercise, the three that we want to track are heart rate, respiration rate, and temperature. And so to measure your horse's heart rate, uh, you can do this a number of ways, right? The way that I like to do it is you count the number of beats. And so one like bump, bump, that's one, okay, for your horse's heartbeat. Do 15 seconds and multiply by four to get to 60. So how many beats per minute? There's lots and lots of pulse points on the horse's body. Um, the most common ones are the facial artery. So this is on the left-hand side, okay? And those are both pictures of that. So if you, I usually take like two or three fingers that you put under midway in the horse's jaw, and then you can feel that facial artery. It's a little bit smaller, I would say, than my pinky fingers. You can kind of roll your fingers over that and find it and then press gently up again the inside of the lower jaw to find that. And then be mindful, right? A horse's heart, resting heart rate is gonna go boom, 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 right? So it's not like ours where we feel it. And so it can take a minute to make sure that that's what it is. And sometimes what I will tell people, it's easier exercise them first and then find it. Cause then you can kind of find where it's at. And then when they're resting, when it's more difficult to find that, try it again. Uh, the transverse facial artery is another one. That artery is not as big, but again, something that you can, whoops, you can use. Um, also a stethoscope, um, the heartbeat actually, right, is one way to do that. And so it, you would kind of have to push that stethoscope up underneath the horse's elbow to listen for it. There's also the radial artery uh, that goes behind the horse's knee or carpus, and then digital arteries as well. And no matter where you take the horse's pulse on the body, it's all the same, right? If I take it, a digital artery versus the facial artery, it's all gonna be the same because it's the heartbeat. That's what, we're, that's what we're measuring, okay? There's also heart rate monitors. These are kind of cool. Um, this is a polar heart rate monitor. It's about a $200. Uh, this can go underneath your saddle, your tack, and then there's apps on your phones, on your watches, so you can, during exercise, kind of track your horse's heart rate, okay? So that's one option for that. And these are just some websites for a couple of different, different heart rates. Uh, respiration rate's another thing that we need to be able to count, okay? And again, respiration rate, sometimes I will have my students will lunge the horses first or we'll turn them out in the arena so they get kind of going a little bit and then it's easier to see their flank going up and down. So if a horse is breathing eight times a minute, that can be kind of hard to see. Like, did they take a breath? What's going on? Um, some people will say, put your hand under the horse's nostril to feel their breath. That doesn't really work that well because what happens is they start smelling your hand and then you're getting a miscount of how many breaths per minute they actually are breathing in. And so you can use the nostrils after hard exercise and the nostrils are flaring, but that's also pretty difficult to see a horse at rest breathing, counting their nostrils. They just aren't going to be flared and um, moving. So the flank is really the the best place to do that. And again, having the horse exercise and then get an idea of what that looks like 
will be helpful. Uh, temperature, this is not something I would do like every time I ride my horse before and after, right? Uh, but it is a good idea to take your horse's temperature over a couple different days, a few different days at di different, few different ambient temperatures outside to get a good range of what is my horse's actual resting normal temperature so that you know that, right? That's just good information to have as well. And so we typically say between 99 and 101. Um, obviously, the younger the animal, these are going to be higher for respiration, heart rate, as well as temperature. And so typically we say over 102 is a fever, all right? And there's people we can disagree on, I guess, um, the point, whatever, afterwards, but typically 102, we would say is a fever. Okay. Um, when we think about how horses get energy to do the work that they're doing, okay? It's important to kind of understand this a little bit because it will, it can change how you feed your horses, right? Depending on what level you're looking at competing at. So energy is ATP essentially, adenosine triphosphate. And so horses create that ATP by metabolizing or breaking down fuel stores in their body. So the, the three fuel stores that we are talking about are carbohydrates, and that's stored in the muscle and the liver as glycogen. So it's just a bunch of glucose molecules, small sugar molecules into a big sugar molecule. Um, fats are stored in the adipose or fat tissue as triglycerides, and then proteins uh, are stored um, in the muscles as amino acids. And that has a little asterisk by it because we should, our horses, if horses are using proteins as their primary energy source, they are starving, like they're not in good shape. So we're gonna focus on the carbohydrates and the fats, okay? for this particular, this particular talk. And so it's important to just understand a little bit about the carbohydrates and fats because during exercise, we're gonna break down into aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise. And so during those two types of exercises, horses use different or have access to different fuel stores in their body, okay? So when a horse is in aerobic exercise, and that basically means that their heart rate is gonna be less than about 150 beats per minute, okay? So they're aerobically exercising. These are slower speed things, right? Slower speed, we're not, this isn't like racehorses or jumpers or barrel racers, anything like that. They're gonna be an anaerobic metabolism. But for aerobic exercise, the heart rate is a little bit lower. It's a slower speed and oxygen is required. We need oxygen. The horse's body needs oxygen to break down those fuels. And during aerobic exercise, the horse can use all three of those energy stores. It can use carbohydrates, it can use fats, and it can use proteins, okay? But again, we're focusing on the carbohydrates and fats because in a healthy horse, that's what they should be using. Anaerobic exercise or during anaerobic metabolism is when that horse starts to exercise harder and their heart rate is getting up over 150 beats per minute. These are higher speeds, more intense workouts. Oxygen is not required. Okay, because it, the reason is, is it takes too long. Like this, the process that's required for oxygen uh, takes too long. And during anaerobic exercise or when that horse's heart rate starts to get up, they need energy more quickly. And so oxygen is not utilized for this. But the only fuel stores the horse can use for this are carbohydrates. Okay, so glycogen is the only thing they can use. And so part of what we want to do when we're exercising our horses is to increase their fitness level so they can stay in this aerobic metabolism, okay, where they're able to use all the sources, where they're able to use carbohydrates and fats, okay, as energy. And then they can save or spare that glycogen for that anaerobic work when that's the only thing they have, the only option they have for fuel, okay? And so again, when we look at oops, this aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism, okay, what's happening in the horse's body, this will depend on the intensity of the exercise, like I said, slower work, less than 150 beats per minute for their heart rate, aerobic metabolism. And when we start to get up over that 150 beats per minute, the body inside is having to kind of switch over where it's getting its fuel stores from, okay? And so that happens with that heart rate. And then the blood lactate level, and lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism, okay? And so when, and we're not, I mean, most people probably aren't gonna be doing blood lactate measurements on the horses, um, but that gives us a good physiologic mark that we know when the horse's blood has a lactate concentration of four millimoles per liter or higher, 
they are in anaerobic metabolism, okay? And, and this is just a graph of what that kind of looks like. So you can see it's pretty steady, like their heart rate, percent heart rate max, the, um, the green line at the bottom. And then when they hit that um, threshold where they're increasing that heart rate, that lactate concentration in their blood is increasing significantly because now they're using anaerobic metabolism to get that energy, okay? And so again, having both, so even if you only do, even if you're showing just Western pleasure, or if you're trail riding, or like our therapy horses are not doing a lot of anaerobic metabolism in their workouts. But what we can do during conditioning is if we push them into that anaerobic metabolism, uh, anaerobic exercise space, they become fitter aerobically, okay? And then they can use those energy stores, the glucose and the fats to metabolize um, those fuel stores for ATP and then save the glycogen for anaerobic work or really hard work when that's all they have as a choice, okay? And if we look at, so there's many different, like if you if you go online and Google conditioning for horses, there's lots of different pyramids and theories and ways of doing things. I like this one because it's pretty straightforward. And so we're just gonna kind of go through this. Um, the stages of conditioning. So this phase one or preliminary work, we would consider as low intensity aerobic exercise. Um, and fairly constant. So continuous exercise versus interval training. And so we're gonna be doing a lot of walking and trotting. This can be riding, it could be lunging, it could be long lining, um, it could be on a walker or a treadmill if you have access to that. But benefits are gonna be improving cardiovascular and muscular fitness, okay? And reducing the risk of injury because you're strengthening those muscles, tendons and ligaments, okay? For the walk and trot, okay? Um, and so depending on what this looks like, if you have a young or immature horse, right, that could be a really long time, three to 12 months, because we have to be super mindful in young horses that we're not pushing them too far too quickly because then you have injuries pop up, okay? Um, and then a month in a mature horse, right? So 45 minutes of walk and trot, um, that they're able to do that consistently in a state where they're not like, you know, gasping for breath at the end of the, at the, end of the session, right? We want them to, to be fit and, to improve on their fitness. Um, I also like to include, so not only in the preliminary work, but this will help with the, the suppleness of the horse. I would include this throughout everything that you're doing uh, is the is our carrot stretches um, or whatever you wanna call them, but just doing different stretches with your horses. It's a good idea when you're starting these out, if you haven't done these with the horse, you have a panel or a wall that they're up against because it's hard, especially if they're super stiff and their muscles are not real flexible. Um, they're going to want to swing their hind end to the opposite direction if you're asking them to turn their head one way or the other. It also can help to have um, an assistant help hold your horse a little bit. Um, and so using the carrot to entice them or treat or whatever. However, do watch your fingers. I, my lovely student here, Isabel, did a little project last summer and she got, she got bit pretty badly because she wasn't paying attention. And so we also, you can get like a, I don't know, a plastic jug or something and then like cut a hole in it if you've got a horse that's kind of a monster about treats. Um, and then you also do have to consider that uh, because they sometimes can get a little mouthy. So that's up to you about, about using the treats, but sometimes they need that motivation. And then doing that repetition, so starting slowly like three to five reps per exercise or whatever you have time to do, right? Time is important. And then increasing the number of days a week that you're, that you're doing those exercises. Um, and then also gymnastic work. And so this is just like it sounds, just kind of like gymnastics for horses. So using ground poles, logs, if you have a farm or, or access to like fallen trees, as long as there's no spiky things sticking out of them, okay? And I actually like landscape timber. So in the lower right-hand corner, I much prefer landscape timbers to round poles because the poles roll. If a horse knocks them, they roll and they can trip on them. So I really don't like a, like a straight round pole. Um, I like the landscape timbers, or there's actually uh, jumping poles that are made that are octagon shaped. Those are a lot more expensive than the landscape timbers are. And so what is important for gymnastic work, however, is to make sure that your spacing between the poles is correct. Because if your spacing is incorrect for your horse's gait, you're gonna, it's not gonna really be helpful, okay? And so these are just very starter, spacings and you're going to adjust those based on your horse's gait and probably your discipline as well. Okay. So we don't want the horse's gait to be stifled, 
when they're walking through these, okay? We want them to be able to walk a natural walk. And so those are some suggestions to start with. And then you can also, I would start in straight lines having them go over the center, but then you can increase, like you can do it on a circle so that they are having to purposefully shorten or lengthen their stride, okay? Um, but again, just make sure you've got your spacing right. And then gradually increase in the number of poles. The first time you do this, if your horse has never done pole work, you're not gonna set up like 10 poles and expect them to go through it, right? You would set up two or three and then increase the number of poles that you are setting out there if, if they're successful at it, okay? And then you, you do it eight to 10 times, do something else, come back eight to 10 times a different way. So you're not drilling it into their brain, but you're giving them an opportunity to, um, to expand their horizons when it comes to the work, okay? And then if we look at kind of going up that pyramid, the developmental work or phase two, you're gonna start adding some cantering and suppling exercises, okay? Uh, and I guess I should mention, so this is from a horse that wasn't, had no fitness, right? Like if your horse is already in pretty good shape, you don't have to now go back and walk and trot them only for a month, okay? So this would be a horse that's kind of coming out of the pasture after winter. So phase two with this developmental work, adding cantering and suppling exercises. And so these are just some examples, right? Of some different things. And I've got somebody in a Western saddle and someone in dressage saddle. And the thing is, good horsemanship is good horsemanship. And a horse that is supple and is broke can do a reining pattern, like maybe not with the sliding stop, right? Okay, but a dressage horse or a whatever, a really broke trailer ranch horse could do a dressage test. They could do a reining pattern. Those specific discipline things like a sliding stop or like, you know, a pirouette, maybe they're not gonna be able to do, but those basic, basic maneuvers, all horses should be able to do those because that's just a demonstration of like, brokenness and flexibility and um, good control that the, that the horseman has. And so again, these are also things that you can just vary, right? Your horses, your horses routine up so they don't get bored of just going in a circle around the arena, okay? Uh, and so another thing that can be introduced is this interval training. So this is what I talked about a little bit earlier where we wanna push our horses maybe into that anaerobic zone so that they're fitter for their aerobic respiration or their aerobic exercise. And so you can have, just like in humans, right? If anybody exercise, if you have the, um, the stair stepper thing, like you can plug it in and you can do a little bit low and then it goes really hard for a minute and then it comes back down again. You can do the same thing with your horses, okay? And so something might look like this. So this has speed on the other side. So you can just kind of ignore the, the speed because we're probably not, most of us don't have a treadmill that we're using, but you can have heart rate over there, right? And so you might walk, jog your horse for two minutes, and then maybe you're going to long trot them for two minutes, and then you're going to walk, jog, and then you're going to long trot, you know, or whatever. Or you're going to canter. You're going to you're going to lope. You're going to do different things in there that are going to increase their heart rate and get different metabolism um, working, okay, in their in their body as well. And so. The last phase then um, is gonna be like this fast, intense work. And so some horses maybe don't get here, right? Like our therapy horses, uh, horses that are doing Western pleasure, maybe hunter under saddle are not gonna be necessarily doing these huge bursts of energy, right? For these very intense competitions. Um, if that's not something that, that you're going to do with them, maybe they don't even need to get here, okay? But if they do, then that's something that certainly has to be practiced, right? And so another thing that we really, I just wanna sort of drive home is that you have to write this stuff down, okay? If you really wanna track your horse's fitness, you need to write it down because if you don't write it down, unless you have some sort of an incredible brain and memory, I cannot remember yesterday. And so I can't remember what I did with my horse. I write down, what did we do? How long did we ride, right? What was our, um, our conditioning plan for that day, and then heart rate before and heart rate immediately after, right? When you're done with exercise. So writing those things down and then one minute, five minute, 10 minute. And I have a sheet on here that you guys can, can print and have. Um, and so it's also important to start slowly. Like you're not gonna pull your horse out of the pen or pasture they've been sitting in for three months and like hop on and go for a six mile trail ride, right? That's probably not a, 
not a great fair thing to do with that horse. Um, so starting slowly, because think about you, right? Like if you haven't done anything all winter and then you're like, I'm going to go take a little jog for six miles, probably isn't going to be great the next few days for you. And so thinking about that um, with our horses, right? We need to consider, consider their fitness level as well. Um, also understanding that to get fit, like it takes work and it's uncomfortable. But you're going to gradually increase distance speed and incline if you have access to hills. Um, the little digression, the um, race trainer that I worked for when I was in grad school many years ago, we had to build a hill in uh, College Station, Texas, because there were no real hills. And so Hank built us a hill. We had to walk those horses up and down at like 10 times a day. That was part of our training for those horses was to build their, their quarter um, their high muscles, right? They're a quarter horse resources. And so those inclines can really help um, to develop that as well if you have access to that. And so this is just a, um, a progress sheet that I just made, okay, that we did. Um, we do this with our program horses because again, like our, our therapy horses don't do a lot of intense work, but they do have to be safe fit and they do have to stay, stay sound. And so it just gives you a little kind of sheet that you can kind of track what you're doing with horses. And again, the heart rate is the main thing that you want to be writing down and thinking about um, as well. And then, oops, also, sorry, one more thing at the bottom, make sure that you're making a note of where you're doing this. Are you in the indoor? Um, is Was there a thunderstorm that day? Is it 85 degrees outside with 90% humidity, right? Or is it like today when I woke up and it was 40? versus yesterday. So you might look at your progress and go, oh my gosh, my horse's heart rate was super high yesterday. And we did, you know, the same thing today and it was not as high or vice versa, right? So that can give you a false sense of fitness when you look at that, if the weather is drastically different. Okay, so that's important to note. And then also a subjective assessment of their performance. Like, did something seem weird or off that day? Um, that's right. You know your horses. And if something seems funny, you should make a note of that and then just kind of be mindful about that for next time. This is just a little kind of a chart of recovery of vital signs and what we want to see. So by 20 or 30 minutes, that horse should definitely be back to normal. If at um, zero minutes, like immediately when you're done exercising, one minute, five minutes, their heart rate has not significantly come down or the respiration rate is still high, that's telling you that you probably you push them too hard that day. So then you need to go back and look at what you have planned and then revise that for your next, okay? Uh, and so this is uh, just a sample for an unfit horse. So just starting again with 30 minutes, four or five times a week, walking, adding trotting. So you can see we're adding trotting and then we're adding cantering and we're adding the amount of time that we're riding. So it's just super gradual kind of thing that you might do with your horses. And then also, so that walking doesn't have to just be straight walking around, right? That's where we can include some of that gymnastic work at the walk or walking outside or doing different things in the arena with your horse. Um, and then signs of fatigue. So again, we already mentioned an elevated pulse or body temperature that does not decrease. And so if you're in a situation, and this typically wouldn't happen unless it's super, super hot outside, um, but if your horse is not cooling down and that is not dropping, it's very important to get them out of the sun, get cool water on them and get a fan on them. Okay, get their body cooled down um, right away. That would be pretty rare. I think that would happen up here in North Dakota, but um, in the Southern states for sure, if you're taking your horse someplace that's super hot and they're not used to that, to be mindful of that. Um, if there's ever an inversion of heart and respiration rate. So if your horse's respiration rate is higher than the heart rate, you should call the vet, like that's, that's bad, that's not good. Um, and again, that wouldn't be an expectation from a typical conditioning program at all. Uh, if they seem weak, if there's excessive sweating for the amount of work that you did, if they don't wanna move, like if their muscles start to cramp up um, and they're just not able to do something that they usually can do, okay? So those are all red flags. Um, and so then just in summary, I would say just to revisit those conditioning consideration slides, before you begin uh, and then working gradually, looking to monitor progress by writing it down and that heart rate is, is our most important thing that we wanna look at there. And then these are just some online resources that are 
good. So Kentucky Equine Research, My Horse University is a collection of um, equine extension agents from around the country that put together really great information. So you can check that out and you can search anything probably and it will come up there. And then the horse is another, is a publication that's got some pretty good information. Uh, stretches, again, you can find the carrot stretches. There's videos online, I think that are probably more helpful. There's also a very cool PBS video, did a, PBS did a series with the BBC called Inside Nature's Giants, where they dissect different giant animals. And so they do a horse dissection on there of a racehorse. And so um, I know some people don't want to see a dissection or the insides of a horse or look at that. But if, if you do, it's very, very interesting. They do the lung expansion. They look at the ligaments, the ligaments and the tendons the guts, so everything, so it's a pretty cool thing. They also do a sperm whale and um, a squid, so there's lots of animals, but it's just really interesting, I think, to see that anatomy in um, the horse. It helps you understand a little bit more and give you a better appreciation for what, um, what is going on with your horse. And then these are, again, there's so much out there for resources, but these are a few that I really like. Uh, there's a book, Equine Fitness, and it even has some like fitness training cards in there. And then 101 Western dressage exercises for horses and riders. Uh, you can do just regular dressage too, right? It, um, it, it doesn't matter. So those are all just really good exercises for your horse. On the ground training exercises for every horse and handler, Cherry Hill's got some great, and these are great, like you can keep them by the arena, they're spiral bound, and it's one page of an exercise and they go to the next one. And then there's a core conditioning for horses as well. Yeah, I have. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I went a couple minutes long, sorry. So we have like six minutes, I think it looks like for questions. There are quite a few in the chat box oh, or goals that people me just... um, mentioned. And then okay. a couple have come to me privately. So I'll just okay. go down the list and read them to you and, and okay. kind of rapid fire, we can answer them. Okay. Um, how long should you walk or trot before going to a higher speed? So again, that's gonna kind of depend on, okay, sure. So that'll depend on your, like the horse's fitness level, right? And so the, um, the that sample program that I showed you guys was from a veterinarian that recommended for a horse that was like just coming back to work, right? And so, so not to say like, you can't canter your horse for five weeks because they're not fit enough. And so that is gonna be something where you would, know your horse, but I would do like a lot of walking, a lot of long trotting. Um, and then you certainly can introduce, right, you know, cantering in there. But if your horse is coming off of doing nothing all winter long, I sort of, I mean, not to anthropomorphize, but I kind of think about like with, with humans, when you're coming back to, to a fitness program, right, you're not going to like go hard right away, because then you're going to increase the chance of injury. So the reason that we want to start slowly um, the reason that we want to go gradually is because we want to reduce the risk of injury for our horses. Okay. So again, that's not to say don't canter your horse for a month, but just be mindful of how much you're asking them to do based on their fitness level, their age, and all those types of things. Okay. Another one that came in is on average, how long does it typically take to get a horse to peak performance? One month, two months, three months. Okay. So again, that's like, um, totally going to depend, right? But so we, so we start to see those improvements in cardiovascular changes, like from those graphs that we noticed, like two months, right? So we can see a significant improvement if that horse is being worked like consistently. We can't do once a week and then expect that their oxygen consumption is going to improve drastically by two months, right? They need to have consistent work, you know, three to five days a week to have that increase in cardiovascular fitness and respiratory fitness, and then musculoskeletal fitness. So that's going to take longer. So seeing, you know, improvements in strength um, is going to take a longer period of time. So we did a little project last summer with our therapy horses who were very overweight and very out of shape. And we just walk trotted them. They're also are, are older. We just walk trotted them on a lunge line from like 20 to 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and we saw in over an eight week period, so two months, a significant improvement in their fitness and their weight that was lost, um, the, their flexibility when we did the carrot stretches, 
was a subjective measurement, right? We didn't like objectively measure that with anything, but we definitely, there was a difference from the first day of starting those carrot stretches to the end, and then just their movement and flexibility. So there's eight weeks, you know, six to eight weeks, I would expect um, before we saw like real visible types of, of changes, right? So probably a minimum of four, but again, that depends. How often are you working? How consistent are you being? All that stuff. Another question was, is there a difference between older horses versus younger horses and how quickly they can um, get back into shape? Yes, for sure. And so with younger horses, so depending how young they are, right? Because we have to think about the skeletal system, the skeletal maturity of those bones, okay? And so too much, too fast, on either a young horse or an old horse is not gonna be good. Pardon the phone. Um, and so taking into consideration, you know, the actual age of that horse and thinking about, like with both of those, I would, you really wanna make sure that you're, that you're going at a pace that is not going to increase the risk of injury for them. And so for both a younger and an older horse, groundwork, great, right, depending on how old they are. Like our older therapy horses, we don't ride them. Like they don't need to be ridden. They're 29 and they do the littles, but they do need some fitness. They need to be long line. We long line them um, or do some lunging with them to try to keep that fitness up. And so because the skeletal structure of a three-year-old is much different than a 20-year-old, right? And so there's a lot of difference there. That's not, that's like a non-answer. Sorry. No, nope, it no depends. Problem. It's like my answer for everything. Yes. If there's any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or unmute your microphone and ask them. I have one more here on my list. And the question is, how do you know if you've overdone it? Okay. So how do you know if you've overdone it with your horse? So I would say like their behavior, right, is going to be one thing and that might their willingness to, to perform. So probably the next day or the day after, if they have, if their muscles are really sore, right? Um, that's not going to show up right away. That's going to show up the next day or two days later. And so noticing how they are when you ride them the next time can be an indicator. If you're doing the heart rate thing, and that would be one indicator that the heart rate didn't come down right away like it should, okay? Or it's staying elevated for 10 minutes. That's a very good indicator that that was too much. But if you don't have access to that, or you didn't take their heart rate that day or whatever, thinking about like their muscle soreness, are they willing to move? Are they not willing to move? What is, is kind of going on on there? And again, part of that is going to have to be that they're going to do things that they don't want to do, right? So you have to kind of know your horse and know, are they just being, are they just being stubborn and don't feel like doing it that day? Or is something super painful? And that's why, right? And so if something's super painful, um, you know, some horses are real stoic and they're just going to like push through and do it. Whereas others are like, I can't, that hurts too much. And maybe it's not, you know, as big of a deal as you think it is. So just knowing your horse is really important with that as well. All right. Thank you. I think I got through all of them in the chat. If I missed any, again, please feel free, free to unmute or to type it in again. Otherwise, I think that's all that was on the list that came to me. Okay. Any last minute questions? All right, seeing none, thank you so very much. Yes, thank you. And if anybody has other questions, you can feel free to email me as well or email any of these um, women and they can get in touch also. So thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.